John chapter 4, the woman at the well. If you're there, say amen. 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 Are you ready to roll? All right. The Bible says, The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized but his disciples. When the Lord learned of this, he fought with them, and they had a theological argument until everybody was sick and tired of talking about the Word of God. Is that what it says? No, but that's what what most of us would do, right? We'd all argue about who's doing what. That's not Jesus. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well it happened to be about the sixth hour or noon when a samaritan woman came to draw water jesus said to her will you give me a drink his disciples had gone into town to buy food the samaritan woman said to him you are a jew and i am a samaritan woman how can you ask me for a drink for jews do not associate with samaritans and jesus answered her If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and this well is very deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, and also did his sons and his flocks and herds? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will thirst again but whoever drinks the water that i give will never thirst indeed the water i give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life the woman said to him sir give me this water so that i won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water he told her go call your husband and come back i have no husband she said and jesus said to her you are right when you say you have no husband in fact The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you have now is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. I think we can stop there. Go get your husband. Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you're right. You're right. I wonder what Jesus wants us to see about our life that's stopping us from living a life filled with the springs of living water. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word, this passage, Lord, this truth, this meeting, this divine appointment that you had with a woman at a well so many years ago. And Father, I'm thankful that it still rings true today to guide us, direct us, Lord, to encourage us and to prompt us to be your witnesses for Christ. I pray, Lord, that you would use us today not to humiliate us, not to condemn us, but, Father, to show us by the power of the Holy Spirit that we are useful. And there are people out there named Danny, named Beth, named Jill, named Chad, named Monica who need to hear the saving grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, apply this to us that you would convict us to action for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of our Lord in heaven. (laughs) Discipleship. The key play, the winning play. What's the winning play that we watched and saw last week? It is... Were you all sleeping last week? discipleship 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 go and do what go into all the nations right and make disciples baptize them in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit and then teach them to obey all that i have commanded you and know this i will be with you i think we forget that part i'll be with you to the end of the age jesus was intentional And nothing for the kingdom of God will come easily or without intentionality. 
as river, as water rushes underneath the bridge, so will our lives pass by, not bearing any fruit if we are not intentional about our walk with Christ, the commands of Christ, and our obedience to Christ, and our devotion to Him, giving our time, our talents, and our resources to Him wherever He sees fit, no matter how tired and wiped out we are from being busy in this world, God still commands us to go and make disciples. He calls us to be witnesses. You will be my witnesses in all of Judea, right? Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria to the ends of the earth. But some of us will miss out on that opportunity. Anybody watch The Grinch? <laughs> Do you like his dog? I like his dog. Who has not seen The Grinch? Who likes the cartoon better than Mr. Carey's version? <laughs> what was wrong with The Grinch? What? You can talk. It's not a library. It's a church, right? Shout. Small heart. How many sizes too small? Three sizes too small. He was self-consumed with who? Himself. He was set on destroying everybody's Christmas. He stole all the gifts, right? Stole all the gifts. But then towards the end of the movie, he hears Whoville. You know those cute little Whoians, whatever they're called, Whoians? They're like Martians, crossed with a mouse. He heard them. What were they doing? While well, he had his sleigh at the top of the mountain with his little dog sitting there dressed up like a reindeer and this giant bag of all the gifts and the lights and the decorations that he stole from Whoville, what did he hear down in Whoville? Oh, he heard singing. Don't sing. Okay, I won't. I won't. So I was like, please spare us. I don't even know what they were singing. I can't remember right now. But they were singing. And the narrator was saying that the Grinch realized that Christmas was not bought in stores, right? But it came from the heart. And at that moment, Jim Carrey starts floundering and flopping around like a fish out of water because something was transforming in his body. What was happening to him? His heart was growing and growing and growing. There are two distinct courses that you can take when you walk with the Lord Jesus. One is to cultivate a very, very small heart. That's what the Grinch did. It's the safest way to go because it minimizes our sorrows. If we don't have a heart for other people, we don't get involved in other people. Sorrow is minimized. If our ambition is to avoid the troubles of life, the formula is simple. Minimize the entanglements through relationships and carefully avoid anything that is of a noble idea and will escape a host of afflictions. If we cultivate deafness in our ear, which is then transformed to our heart, we will be saved from the discords of life. Cultivate blindness and we will not see the ugly, ugly, ugly presentation of life that some people have found themselves in. If we go through life with minimum of troubles, all you have to do is reduce the size of your heart towards other people. This is how many people today live. This is how many people who call themselves Christians and name the name of Christ, they get through life's tribulations by cultivating the smallness of heart. Missing out on touching anybody's life, getting entangled in any mess out there, sliding through life with all that they're doing a being about themselves it's much easier it's much simpler that way it's much safer that way tune out the cries 
of the weary tune out the cries of those underneath the bridges tune out the cries of those going through tragedy in their marriage tune out the cries of the children who are turning to drugs ad nauseum because parents will not listen to their cries turn off the volume of what the world is screaming and you'll live a comfortable but sad and ineffective life but then there's another path the other path is always open to us namely it's open to ourselves and to others that we would become susceptible to the gamut to the plethora of sorrows that people hiding under bridges hearts are filled with that many people know nothing about because they choose to know nothing about if we enlarge our heart and our purposes will increase our vulnerability exponentially. And I think that's where it begins to get tricky. Yes, discipleship is messy. Getting involved in other people's lives will bring sorrow to yourself because you'll begin to care about other people and where they are, all the while knowing that you have the answers within you to share with those who feel broken, hopeless, and without a miracle maker. Yes, it can get ugly. Yes, it can take some of your time. Yes, it can become wearisome. It could be draining because people who do not have life in them will suck the life out of you, but you don't have to let them suck the life out of you. All you have to do is allow Jesus to fill them with the life that he died on the cross to give them. And some of us know what it's like to go through that because we've enlarged our hearts and we care about other people, and we try to help other people ad nauseum. Sometimes you get frustrated. Don't get frustrated. Stay the course. This is why God still has you on this planet, breathing the oxygen that he has so created to sustain your life. So the question is, as we see in these passages, are you going to be intentional to serve Christ and others or are you going to continue to serve yourself? And these are questions that, you know, as the fly on the wall, it's, it's very interesting that somebody put that there because these are the very questions that I ask myself as I preach sermons to myself in my office, as I'm in my car, as I'm thinking about these sermons week to week, day to day. They're not just for you. They're for myself and for my staff and for anybody who can hear the audible presence of my voice. Don't ever think I'm just up here trying to push you to do more intentional discipleship. It pushes me even more to do intentional discipleship. But our decisions will affect the kind of heart that we have. Little hearts, though safe and protected, never contribute anything to the kingdom of God. No one has ever benefited from restricted sympathies and limited vision for other people in the kingdom of God. Think about this as we sit here comfortable Danny, who has given his life back to the Lord, hated church when he grew up. Who knows where Danny is today? But Danny's life was changed, and that's all that matters because now it's up to the Lord to prompt his people to get in place to disciple one another as iron sharpens iron. So, one man, another. But I'll be vulnerable. That's right. Ministering hearts are vulnerable. But they're also the hearts that know the most joy. And it's the kind of heart that leaves an imprint on a world even when you're gone. You want to make a mark in your life? You want your life to be useful? Make a mark for the kingdom of God even 2,000 and some odd years later, we are still reflecting on a life that was changed at a well in Sikar. 
We're not learning anything else that's of any kind of eternal importance from these scriptures when we look at them. We're not learning about who had the best job, who was going to Macy's on the shore to buy the finest clothes. We are learning from page one to the end how God changes lives through redemption. That is the scarlet thread all through the Bible. But cultivate deafness and you'll never hear the discords of life, but neither will you ever hear the glorious symphony of the Lord Jesus rejoicing in heaven over one repentant sinner coming to salvation cultivate blindness and you'll never see the ugly but neither will you see the beauty of god's creation because you'll be so focused on yourself so if we have a small heart sure our boat will sail smoothly the glass that we live on will be smooth as ice but neither neither will we know of the intoxicating winds of the holy spirit that leads us into situations where he prompts us to speak out Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. <laughs> so the choice is up to us. Do we live for ourselves, all consumed, sliding through life, very little change and very little effect on others around us, or do we give our lives to the Lord and go where the Holy Spirit prompts us to go, to speak? what we have been saved by so that other people can be saved by the Lord as we are witnesses. Jesus here could have gotten to a fight with Pharisees, but instead he figures, you know what? They have no idea the food that my Father has given me. I have come to save. I have come to seek and to save that which was lost. So Jesus doesn't argue when there is this issue over who's baptizing the most. He just picks up and goes because he's like, you know what? Better than an argument with you guys is a conversation with a woman that is divinely appointed and waiting for me at a well. I have better things to do than to argue with men. And Jesus must go through. He had to go through. Why did he have to go through? Because nobody would go through Samaria because they were the underdogs. They were the ugly of uglies. They were the mixed breed of people that nobody associated with taken off by the Assyrian army the Jews and then repopulated as they cross mingled and pollinated with other people no Jew on the right in the right mind on the planet would have anything to do with Samaritans so therefore nobody would ever venture in to share the saving grace of Jesus how many people out there look so different than us that we would never think about going to 105 East Pine Street because that's a crack ad that's a crack house or that's on the other side of the tracks. And Jesus says, what are you worried about? Lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. I have been given all authority, all the power. What are you worried about? Well, we might die, so what? Come home to me. That's my grace to you. Leave that place. But go out winning. Go out bringing Danny's from under the bridge and off the river into the kingdom as you speak the word of God. Jesus had to go through. I wonder how many of us know the place that Jesus wants us to go to, but yet we still keep making excuses. Jesus doesn't make excuses. He had to go to Samaria. Why? Because he had a ministering heart. He had a heart that was three times bigger than what we have. He went to this lady. He came to a town called Sychar near the plot of ground that Jacob had given his son. He was tired. He was tired from the journey. Jesus, God, in, in human flesh became tired as he went from his journey. So what did he do? He does what anybody would do that gets tired. They sit down. They find a place to sit down. So he sits down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. And we can come up with all kinds of excuses, folks. I'm, I'm one to do it just as well as you. 
I've been in ministry 25 years. I've heard every excuse out there underneath the sun. Why I can't let Jesus, why I won't do for Jesus. I know that Jesus won't do this for anybody. Why we will not go. I've tried, I've done, it's not worked, la, 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 la. Jesus was tired. Jesus had to find time just to get away from the crowd to go spend time with his father, but yet he never gave up. In the book of Mark, he, he ministered all the way into the ends of the night, into the early mornings, but yet still found time to get up early in the morning the bible says to go spend time with his father because that's where his food that's where his strength that's where his direction and energy came from that's why jesus though he was tired never made an excuse because he had a heart that ministered to people he's ministered to each and every one of us in this room and he continues to minister to each and everyone in this room but jesus wants to minister to those who are far from him and so he goes even though he's tired because he has a ministering heart and he's intentional sure he could have gone the easy way right it's going to there are going to be a lot of conversations because of jesus's decision jesus how in the world can you go into samaria first off second off how in the world can you talk to a samaritan third off how can you talk to a female Samaritan. Jewish males were not, rabbis nonetheless, were not even allowed to speak to it, not even their wife in public. Jesus, he doesn't care about any barriers that man throws out there. He doesn't care about anything that we fabricate to stop and give excuses to why we can't go to the well. Folks, there is a well out there waiting for you to go to. It doesn't matter how tired you are. Jesus has divine appointments all over. Well, I messed up. So what? Who isn't messed up? Who hasn't messed up? Anybody here pure as the driven snow? Anybody? I mean, I, I scratch my head, and the Lord reminds me every single day, neither are you, Drew. Stop it, as Bob Newhart would say. I got two words for you. Stop it. Oh, do I need to write them down? Remember that? That's an awesome clip. You need to go watch it. Just stop it. And save everybody tons of counsel. Just stop it. But Jesus goes and he sits down, and then a Samaritan woman came to draw water. Jesus said to her, oh my gosh, Jesus spoke. How are you intentional with people? I don't know what to say with people. <laughs> what does Jesus do? Let's look at Jesus. He's an intentional disciple maker, okay? He's going after a woman, hook, line, and sinker, in a place that nobody ever would expect Jesus to go to speak to somebody that they would never expect Jesus to speak to. What does he do? He sits down. It's hot as can be. This lady's coming out because she doesn't want to be around people that know who she is because she's that woman of the night. You know, she's had five husbands, and even now the one that she's with isn't even her husband. She's like, forget the whole marriage thing. It's easier just to live this way. They're going to leave me anyway. What does Jesus do? He goes and he sits down, and here comes this woman. Is he shaking? Is he nervous? Is he popping his anxiety meds because he doesn't know what to say or how to be human and speak to people to engage in just an intentional conversation? No, Jesus just does what you and I naturally should do. What does he do? Just... He's tired. He's by a well. Here she comes. She's probably got buckets and some kind of scooping device, whatever. Hey, can I have a drink? I mean, is that like earth shattering? I mean, do you need to go get a PhD to be intentional to start a relationship? No. Jesus just does what you and I would naturally do if we're just human with a big heart and doing something intentional prompted by the spirit of god we just say hey how are you who are you hey uh, you have three kids wow what are their names oh i love that jacket you're wearing where did you get that even if you could care less about the jacket you know we don't have to make it that difficult do we 
Jesus simply says, will you give me a drink? And notice where his disciples are. His disciples are serving themselves and their group. They are off buying food. They're busy. They could have stayed. I don't know where does it say that Jesus said, go get food. The disciple had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, oh my goodness, you're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with the Samaritans. And Jesus answered her. Look at that. Jesus just answers her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. What does Jesus not do in this situation? He, he doesn't go condemn her. He doesn't go with cultural norms. He doesn't go with the flow of society. He speaks to her. She knows her whole life that this is a situation that should not be happening. And Jesus wants nothing to do with what the world has cultivated as normal. Jesus is the norm. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the standard of what we should follow because he is the way, the truth, and the life. He could have argued with her. He could have taken the sideshow with her. But he doesn't because he is on a mission to give this lady truth. Why does he want to give her truth? Think about people that you have led to the Lord. What don't they know? A lot. That's right. Jesus is going to reveal himself to this woman. Why? Because he says, if you knew, she clearly does not know. And she is a Samaritan. They believe in the first five books of the Bible, and that is it. She should know that Messiah is coming. She should know who God is. But he says, if you knew, you don't know. There are a lot of people out there, folks, contrary to what we have massaged ourselves to believe. They do not know Jesus. They have some fabricated idea, but they do not know the truthfulness, the lovingness, the forgiveness, the, 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 the mercy that God has. They have no idea. And so what do they need? They need someone like you and me who do know the truth to share with them this lady clearly doesn't know if you knew the gift of god and who it is that asked you for a drink hello during the headlights i am messiah here i am but you're so wrapped up in everything else but knowing god you've missed me and i'm right in front of you and i have the drink that you're looking for the drink that will bring satisfaction joy completeness of life without you feeling that you have to keep coming back for something that does not satisfy so many of us here's why we don't share because we are chasing the winds of this world thinking that going after will give us the satisfaction and the completeness that hole it'll fill that hole that we have no only god will fill that hole danny had everything but yet he wanted to blow his brains out at the river why because he was missing the living water that brought life and so he kept coming back to the well the back to the well of drugs back to the well of women back to whatever well you are trying to find life and it will always 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 come up empty and that's what this lady's been doing her whole life and she doesn't get it so you have nothing to draw from this well is deep where can you get this living water are you greater? She goes on a side tangent. Jesus doesn't even engage. Everyone who drinks from this well will be thirsty again. Know that. Mark that. That is the truth. Any well that you are drinking from other than the well of Jesus Christ will leave you thirsty. But whoever drinks the waters that I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Blessed are those 
who hunger and thirst after righteousness for there's a promise that God says you shall be filled you will be filled satisfied and then everything else comes into perspective this well will run dry and it doesn't satisfy me so I don't need to continue to go after it you start taking all the wells out of your life you'll start giving yourself time to serve the life giver the woman said to him sir give me this water so that i won't get thirsty and have to keep coming back he said go call your husband and come back again intentionality there can be no transformation without repentance godly sorrow leads to repentance unto salvation right second corinthians seven somewhere nine in there i think or nine seven i don't know if i'm dyslexic this lady in order to come into the kingdom can't just slide under the radar she must confront what's keeping her she's going after the well of men she's going after everything but the man that can satisfy her and that is jesus and so jesus goes right to the heart of the matter why because he's intentional he is not allowing a moment that god the father has given him to pass by without at least witnessing to the water that he can give this woman and he's calling her to repentance go and get your husband go call your husband and bring him here shoom right away bill goes through her mind <laughs> bill was number one promised me the world he was highly educated had a great job and yet he walked out on me for a secretary boom then ted comes into her mind ted who promised her the world after the first one you know what i will never lie to you i'll never cheat on you boom does the same thing going through each and every one maybe they got worse maybe they became abusive i have no idea but in a flash in a moment jesus confronts her problem that she's going after everything in this world except for him and it's always 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 what satisfied her it's failed her and so here is this broken woman avoiding society wondering what in the world am i here for why am i here what what did you create me for god why is my life taking this turn have you ever asked the lord that why am i here and why is this happening jesus doesn't even condemn her i mean that's the beautiful thing here and that's just probably the tip of the iceberg because that's probably what's most apparent that she's had five husbands and now she's living with some dude that's not her husband there's probably a whole host underneath the water you know the iceberg there's only what a tenth of it above the water the rest is under there's so much wrong with this woman's life and yet jesus does not go back and say let's recount how worthless you are in fact he doesn't even really say anything about the five right he just says, go call your husband and come back. Well, she says, I have no husband. And, and what does he reply? You're right when you say that you have no husband. The fact is, because Jesus knows the fact, even though you do things in front of, uh, outside of people's views, everything you do outside of people's views, you're doing in front of Jesus' view, right? The fact is you have had five husbands and the man that you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. That's all he says. He's like, thank you for admitting you're wrong. What you have said is quite true. She didn't try to sidestep it and Jesus left it at that because Jesus is long-suffering, he is merciful, and he is filled with grace. Where do you see ever see Jesus beating anybody up with condemnation? I mean, he's flipped over some tables. He's yelled at the Pharisees, whoa, you brood of vipers. Why? Because they were trying to teach people the wrong things. He, they were trying to make people wear and carry heavy weights of burden from the law, which even the Pharisees would not even practice. But Jesus is not that way. Jesus wants somebody free from a life of going back to a well that never satisfies and so she says i can see that you're a prophet our fathers worship on this mountain but the jews claim that the place that we must worship is in jerusalem jesus declares believe me woman again he doesn't even fight he just says believe me woman a time is coming when you will worship the father neither on this mountain nor in jerusalem 
You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. If you had the rest of the scriptures and just didn't limit yourself to the first five books, you would understand who Messiah is. You would understand that it's not about a place, a location, geography, a zip code. It's about worshiping the Lord in spirit, being saved and in truth. And the only way to be saved is to know the truth. It's imperative that you know the truth because the truth will set you free. The truth is what leads you to repentance. It's what you are sanctified by. It's what you are saved by. Without knowing the truth and the God who is truth, you'll never ever be able to be filled with the Spirit, nor will you ever be able to worship in spirit and in truth. That's why it's imperative that we spend time at the foot of the Savior martha and mary that's where we understand who jesus christ is not by listening to the winds of this world or from the television the stupid idiot box it's from getting in the word the love letter how many of you have ever written a letter to your now spouse anybody email letter how many of you if you were dating okay go back to the years of dating and the big pen and the college ruled paper and you just angle it and you get that right slant on all your cursive oh they do still do cursive but you'd write these lovely letters out you fold it you know properly so that when they pulled it out of the envelope it would just boom, open up ha huh. and maybe it smelled like you know perfume or cologne or whatever how many of you just would get those letters and you would go forget that just throw it out anybody how many of you never opened a letter that your now spouse or boyfriend or girlfriend wrote? Anybody just throw it out because you're like, Pfft. Jesus has written us one of the largest love letters ever. And if you say that you love him, because we say that flippantly sometimes, I think. If you say that you love him, why don't you read his love letter to you? It's the only way to know the truth. It's the only way to know who he is. This is his revealed word. This reveals himself to us. But yet it's also a mirror. It cuts both ways like a double-edged sword. It shows us who we are in light of him. But not to condemn us, but for us to say, yes, okay, you're right. I don't have a husband. Yeah, you're right, I have five. You're right, I've had this. You're right, I've done that. But there's hope at the well she said I know Messiah who is Christ is coming when he comes he will explain everything to us <laughs> he's been explaining it to you for the last 25 minutes and so he's bold enough to say I who speak to you am he what are you going to do with that just then the disciples return they're surprised of course to find jesus doing something out of the cultural norm he's broken barriers but no one asks, what do you want or why are you talking with her they are in a discipling moment as well they are seeing truly who jesus is a compassionate loving merciful forgiving father who will cross all social and cultural barriers because his heart is three sizes bigger than anybody I've ever seen and he is after people who are not in the kingdom and he's not afraid of what people think then leaving her water jars the woman went back to the town and said to the people come see a man who told me everything I ever did could this be the Christ they came out of the town and meanwhile, the disciples urged him, hey, you need to eat something. I have food to eat that you know nothing about. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say that four months more and then the harvest? I tell you, look, open up your eyes as the entire town of Sychar is coming towards them because of one woman's testimony, because of one man's intentionality to go and meet somebody who no one would talk to. She, somewhere in that journey, places her faith in Christ and goes and tells an entire town. And they all come because of her word, but then they all listen to Jesus. 
You see, you don't have to do it all by yourself. You're just a witness. Jesus will take care of giving them the truth. If they get into the word of God, they will know the truth. And that whole town comes. Many of the Samaritans from that town believe in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. And then verse 40, so when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them stay a little bit and so he stayed for two days and what he do he disciples them and tells them the truth i can imagine no one wanting to go to bed for those two days because jesus was speaking truth and because of his words many more believed many more became believers they said to the woman we no longer believe just because of what you said now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world man do you see the model of intentionality there and not giving a rip about what the world says jesus crossed over barriers because he had a heart that was inclined to minister and what were the effects people coming to know by the truthfulness of who god is coming into the kingdom